Don't we have so much to be thankful for? Amen. Come on now. You weren't ready for that, right? Don't we have so much to be thankful for? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's give God praise. Amen. He is worthy. Praise the Lord. Well, good to have you with us this morning as we are wrapping it up. So if you are like me, you're thinking, I have never heard of or been a part of a 12-part series in a message series, but today is part 12, and today is the wrap. Today we're wrapping it up. And I love this because typically the ending of something in a season, maybe your favorite TV show, there's usually a season finale, right? It's the season finale, and everybody's waiting with bated breath to find out who shot Jr. Said everybody below 50 don't even know what I'm talking about, right? You got to Google that, right? But, but, but it, it's coming to that crescendo. And we're going to wrap it up today. And I love it because you know what this thing is all about? It's all about the gospel. And you know what the gospel means? Good news. Can I help you with something? There is nothing bad in or about the good news. Otherwise, it wouldn't be good news. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Now, you know, you say stuff like that, particularly to church folk, because if you're like me and you grew up in church, I didn't always hear the good news as good news. In fact, I didn't really think a lot of it to be that good. You know, the good part about it to me that I felt like I got from a lot of it was I just wasn't going to hell. Isn't that interesting? But can I help you with something? I'm going to use some Beaufort County lingo. The gospel is a lot gooder. And you probably even realized, and we're going to see that crescendo today. And I love what they said in that verse. Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the reality of it is there's nothing bad about the good news, and we're going to see that good news crescendo in part 12 today. But before we do, let's pray. Father, again, we just want to thank you for the privilege that we have to come together and worship you and to get into your word. Now, Holy Spirit, we just ask you to do what we can't do. This is your word. And we're, we're not the expert, but you are. But you can teach us. You can show us. You can speak through us what you want us to hear and say. And so we lean on you right now to do that. So that as we leave here, Every person leaves with something, like that gift that no one was left out, that we all leave with some nugget, some truth that we can walk away with and take into the week ahead and, and, and life ahead, Father. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Joel, do you have the picture of the gates handy? If you'll throw that, all the gates, you, yep, wrong picture. Yeah, see, that's the end right there. He just, he just blew it on me right there. <laughs> Well, that was the crescendo. All right, y'all go home. I'm just kidding. You got the gospel in there. Yep. He doesn't, he's, he's working on that. Yeah, and he left it up too. He blew it and left it up. That's okay. We don't have that one. All right, you got to find it. It's got to be in there somewhere. I know if you used that same computer last week, it's in there somewhere. And uh, well, y'all walk through it with me while he's looking for it. I think I feel the heat on Doug or, or one of you guys, can y'all make sure that we don't have any heat on? If, we, if it is, uh, it was a little chilly in here first, but I think we nipped it. I think we, we ended that, and uh, the chill is gone. So we don't want y'all getting sleepy and falling asleep. Do you see it at all? Do you see it from last week's message? He's almost there. He is almost there. Well, let's start with what we, what we can just remember off the top of our head. The first gate was the sheep gate. Now, what am I talking about here when you talk about these gates? And, and the title of this series that we wrapped today is called The Gospel and the Gates, and this won't be long, I promise you, because uh, some of you are thinking, I've got to do this review again before we get to today's message. But it's real quick. And, and here's what we see. In the Old Testament story of Nehemiah, we see him being called by God to go back home to Jerusalem. He, along with many Jews, had been in exile first in by King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, in, in really per, uh, modern day Iraq, but then King Artaxerxes conquered him, and then our modern, uh, that day of Persia, which was modern day Iran, that king was really in, in charge of those captives. And they slowly but surely begin to let some of the Jews go back to Jerusalem, let, let them go back. And, and they begin to trickle their way back. And there was a contingent of people there, but yet the, the city remained in ruins. The walls were down, the gates had been burned, and that's the way it was. And so Nebuchadnezzar is a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. He was one of those that had still stayed behind. There we go, thank you. He continued to stay behind. 
And he was there, and he's serving as the king's cupbearer. Now, what is that? It's like the secret service. He tasted the food, drank the wine first before the king did, so that if it was poison, he would get sick and die, not the king. And I, that was a prestigious job, I, I guess, you know, then, and as it probably still is now if you're in the secret service, right? So that's what his job was. He's doing his thing, and a friend comes passing by, and he says, hey, how are things back home? He said, things back home are bad, the walls are down, the gates have been burned, the people are walking around aimlessly, and, and that put a burden in his heart. He began to pray, began to seek God. He's like, Lord, I don't know what am I supposed to do about it, but this burden's on me. You ever had a burden in your heart, and it's like, I'm not qualified for this, this isn't, isn't in my job description, it's not what I went to school for, but yet God puts something in your heart. He, he's doing that on purpose because more than likely he's wanting to use you to make a difference in that situation or that circumstance. And Nehemiah was there, but yet he didn't want to do things in his own power, so he prayed. And then right on time, God right on time, it took a minute, but right on time, God began to answer Nehemiah's prayer, gave him wisdom, and put it in his heart to go back home and rebuild the walls and the gates. But he had to get permission from King Artaxerxes. And, and King Artaxerxes gladly granted him that permission, gave him authority, gave him materials, building materials, gave him armed guards to go back with him, and it was amazing. They go back, and they assess the situation. Sure enough, it was as bad as they thought, uh, but they, 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 they put together a plan. And with that plan, though, rose some opposition. And again, we need to think that we're just going to get saved and, and live an abundant Christian life, which is what God wants us to do, but that we won't have some opposition because we're going to have some opposition. And sometimes that's from without. Sometimes it's from within. But he had it as well, particularly in the form of Sam Ballot and Tobiah, who, who tried to thwart what God was doing. And so the people came together in spite of that, and they worked with a trial uh, in one hand, putting out the mortar and fixing the bricks, bricks, and with a sword in the other. And in 38, 39 days, they completed the mission of rebuilding the walls of the city. And each one of these gates, a gate represented the finishing point. You don't put the doors in on the house until the house is framed, the walls are in, the windows and doors, particularly doors, are one of the last things to go in. And so the gates are set in as the finishing step that the, uh, of the whole project in, in these sections. And, uh, and, and each one of these gates for us, and it's so awesome because we see so much in the Old Testament that represents the gospel in the New Testament. And if you, if you rightly discern the Word of God and you read the Old Covenant in light of it pointing to the New Covenant, you'll see Jesus there. You'll see the, you'll see the gospel there. You'll see, the, you'll see powerful things there. And we see that in this story because in each one of these ten gates in the city, it represents for us some aspect of the Christian life. I mean, these stories aren't just there to fill up a page. It's there so we can glean something and learn something. And so we see these gates, and it starts with the sheep gate. And what does that represent? It represents Jesus. And Jesus is the starting point for the Christian life. Jesus is the starting point for it all. And listen, without him, it's not the gospel. Without him, you're not going to get to the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And it's interesting, though, that Jesus came as the sheep. He came as the uh, 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 of sheep. He came as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, as he pointed to Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God that came to, to take away the sin of the world. Isn't that amazing? And so Jesus came as that lamb. And what did the lamb represent? The lamb represented once passing the inspection of the priest, once being accepted as a spotless lamb, a lamb would take upon itself the sin of the people and the lamb's innocence would be transferred to the people and the lamb would be slaughtered in payment for the, for the sins of the people. And that, that was all part of the old covenant. But the Apostle Paul says what the bulls and goats couldn't do, Jesus as the Lamb of God did it for us once and for all as he became the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. And so we see right there, we come to faith in Jesus Christ who is our Lamb who came through the sheep gate. That's what the sheep gate represents. And then we see the fish gate. And you know some of the best people to share the good news with others are those who, 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 are, who just get saved. 
Religion has a way of messing you up. Once we get religified, we, we ain't as good as we used to be when we first got saved. Because when we first get saved, we get excited about our faith. It's like, man, here I was. I was that. I was blind. Now I see. And there's, you know, there's a pep in your step. There's a joy in your heart. And you know what God does? God's great at taking us and making us fishers of men. That's what he told the disciples. If you'll follow me, I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. And, and, and listen, here's what he does. He uses us as the bait. He uses our lives transformed into his image as the bait to catch other fish. I like watching fishing videos online, and I've watched, a, I've watched them catch a, a nice-sized fish with a small fish, but then they use that bigger fish to catch an even bigger fish. Isn't that interesting? And that's what God does in our lives. He uses us, and that speaks of evangelism. It speaks of really transformation. And evangelism. And evangelism happens as we let God transform our hearts and our lives. And then we see the old gate. And all of this is possible because of the old gate. And what is the old gate? The old gate is the old gate. It's that gospel. It's that good news. It's, 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 it's dancing with the one that brought you. It's like, don't leave what got you here to something newfangled, but stick with what brought you here. And what brought, you, what brought us to the party? Righteousness by faith. And faith alone. And we find that through Abraham. God, listen, Abraham believed God and God counted it as righteousness. And, and that's it. That's the simplicity of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever never sins. No. Whoever votes right in the next election. No. Whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the only requirement. To the good news is simple faith by belief. Righteousness by faith, as the word tells us. And that's the old gate. And we got to stay with that. We can't, we can't be, listen, what, that, that, old, that old story, that, that old truth is the foundational truth that makes this thing work for us. So there's the old gate. And then we got the valley gate. And notice there's a big, long distance between those three gates and the valley gate. And this is what the devil does. He loves to separate us, get us all by ourselves, and tell us we're nothing. Tell us that you, you, you're, you're not needed. Hey, he tells us stuff like you're not a Christian. You, you, had, thought like, you had a thought like that? You, oh, you're not a Christian. He does all kinds of tricks and schemes to bring us in places of valleys. And, and those, are, those are things from, from the outside. Sometimes he works through people to do that, right? But then there's, then there's, then there's, there's, there's the, the, the opportunity of finding ourselves in valleys because of our own doing. Maybe wrong choices we make or mistakes. We get, a, we get on the wrong path. And I've done that in my life. But thank God, listen, that even though you find yourself occasionally in a valley, David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He didn't say I'm going to stay there, build me a, an apartment, get me a condo in the valley. No, he said I'm going to walk through it. He said, though I walk through it, I'll fear no evil. He said, you're riding your staffs with me. The valley isn't the place for the victorious believer, but we may walk through valleys from time to time, amen? But thank God there's a valley gate that when we find ourselves there, there's always a way back in. And aren't you glad for that? There's a valley gate. And then there's the dung gate. And what I find is, is usually when I come out of a valley, I come out a little smarter, hopefully, most times than I were when I went in. And typically, if it was a self-imposed valley that I went through, hopefully I'll learn something and, and I'll, I'll glean something that I'll, and I'll grow and I'll get rid of maybe something that got me in that valley. And as my grandma and granddaddy used to say, you, you, you get shed of it. You get shed of it. What is that? You get rid of it. You, you grow and you mature. And listen, in the process of growth and maturity, there's, there's excrement that needs to be gotten rid of. Just, I'm trying to use good words. Are you with me? <laughs> and, that's what, and listen, and if you didn't have that, it'd be a sure sign that you were dead. So, so that's a good thing, but you got to have somewhere for that to go, and you got to get shed of it, and that's what the valley or the dung gate is for. And dung just really, it means that. Rubbish, trash, sewage, there's a place for that. Amen? And, and listen, even in our walk as a believer, there's a place to just get shed of that. Amen? Maybe it's an old way of thinking. Paul says in Philippians, don't be, uh, don't, uh, don't be uh, oh goodness, don't be... Uh, 
help me, y'all. Uh, don't be, don't be, don't be, don't don't go with the flow of this world. That's Johnny. Okay, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and the Amplified Version basically says by tearing out those old superficial ideas and customs. And when you remodel something, you better have a dumpster nearby to put all that stuff in because you're tearing stuff out because you've got to make room for stuff that you're putting in. And when you tear that stuff out, you've got to get rid of it. Amen? That's the dung gate. And then right next to the dung gate is the fountain gate. And I'm so glad for the fountain gate because that represents the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I love how the fact we come out of that valley, we come out of that place where, man, I, I kind of blew it and ended up in a valley, but I'm coming out, thank God. The Holy Spirit is right there and ready to help us and, and, and help us just grow. And he empowers us to live the Christian life. And, and I find I've, I've found myself in a valley gate at times in my life when I shunned him or I didn't rely on his help to live the Christian life. And I can, you can get in a valley like that. But then, man, when you come out and, 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 and you got rid of those things that, that did you no good, the Holy Spirit is right there, and he is that fountain, oh, my goodness, that, that nothing else describes him. He, he's what everybody's looking for. That woman who'd been married five times and was living with that guy at the moment that Jesus met at the, at the well, she was, she was trying to get her thirst quenched. By all kinds of superficial things and relationships. And finally one day Jesus goes way out of his way to sit down and meet her at the well. She's only there at noon because she lived in shame. She didn't want to be out there with the rest of the women who came out early in the morning. She went out in the heat of the day to get her water so she could be alone. Because her life was just was messed up. It was messed up. We'd say she's messed up today. Can you imagine what they said back then? She was messed up. And she'd been drinking from the wrong, wrong wells. And Jesus said, listen, I'm paraphrasing. He said, girl, if you want to learn how to drink from this well that I want to give you, you'll never be thirsty again. And she took a drink, and it changed her life. And you know what happened? She, she went back to represent the fish gate. She went throughout town telling everybody. She said, come see a man that's told me everything I've ever done. And I would think, that's not a good thing, girl. What, what are you talking about? Can you imagine going around town and says, come see a man that told me everything I ever done, have done? It's like, why would you even say that except for the fact you're free of that old life because you've drunk from a fountain and none of that means anything to you anymore because you're a new you. And that's what she was saying. And, and, and the whole town turns out and they come out and see Jesus and they begged him to stay two or three days longer and he did. And you know what they said at the end? They said, you know what, we came out here because she told us, but now we believe you're the Messiah because we've heard you for ourselves. Isn't that amazing? That's the fountain gate. The fountain gate will transform your life. And then we see the water gate. And what is the water gate? It's not Richard Nixon. Again, I said that last week, and people, some people don't even know what I'm My mom said, half the people don't even know who Richard Nixon was. He was a president, and he did some bad stuff, they say. I mean, he did. The, wa the water gate scandal, right? But listen, that's not that. The water gate here represents the word. And listen, when you're born again, when you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new, right? You're a whole new creation in the, in the eyes of God himself when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. But we're still living in a messed up world, and, and, and our feet get dirty in this messed up world that we live in, and so occasionally our feet need washing. Because in this world we're in, we rub up against and we're around things and, and it, can, it, can, it, it can rub off on us, right? And so we need the washing of the water by the word on occasion to clean us. Like our whole body don't need washing, but we need our feet washed. And that's what Jesus told the disciples when he put that apron around himself and on the night he was betrayed after the Lord's first Lord's Supper, the, the communion, which represented the new covenant, he went around to wash the feet of the disciples and Peter protested. He was the first one. He said, Lord, you can't wash my feet. He's like, well, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you have nothing to do with me. He said, then wash my whole body then. That's what he said, right? He said, I don't need to wash your whole body. And then he looks at everybody and he says, listen, if, if you believe in me, you're clean. He said, but, and I'm paraphrasing, but, but occasionally your feet need washing. You, you're in a dirty world, and what is that? That's the washing of the water by the word. word. What does that do for me? That means, listen, I have to be reminded that I'm the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Because the world 
says I'm not, even religion would just leave me in the state of being a sinner saved by grace. And I know that's a song, and I know it might be your favorite, but it's not biblically accurate. It's not New Covenant accurate, because you are no longer a sinner saved by grace. When you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Apostle Paul calls you a saint. Now, you may not act saintly, and the Catholic Church may not have deposed sainthood on you, okay? But I'm just telling you right now, according to him, he says you're a saint, Wow, if you believed in Jesus. Do you know why that happens and how that's even possible? Because you could say, but you know what? I don't feel saintly. I don't even act saintly all the time. I don't think saintly. But what makes me saintly? What makes you saintly is simply the blood of Jesus Christ. And it continually washes you and cleanses you. And we have to be reminded of that. Amen? We, we have to be reminded of who we are in Christ. And why is that so important? Because right thinking, listen, will lead to right acting. Right believing will, li- will, will lead to right living. If you have the mentality that you're just some sinner saved by grace, you know what you'll struggle with? Sin. If you live in a state of, listen, sin consciousness versus righteous mindedness, you will always struggle. Now listen, you'll never be sinless, but as a believer in Jesus Christ, you should sin less. And how is that possible? It all starts with our thinking and our believing. And we have to be reminded, and that's why the washing of the water by the Word is so extremely important to us as believers. We have to be reminded of who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? And that's the the water gate. And then the horse gate. What is that? That represents spiritual warfare. But not just spiritual warfare, it represents our victory. The Apostle Paul says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know what a good fight is? And Paul says fight the good fight of faith. You know what a good fight is? A good fight is a fight that you're in and that you win. Like if you went into a fight like Mike Tyson fought. Like was that last night? I saw an interview online this morning early. I was scrolling through my phone. I, I saw the interview. I think they called it a draw. And the guy that he fought, he said, yeah, it was a draw, but my, my ribs sure do hurt. <laughs> he basically said, those body blows really have affected me. I'm like, okay, wow. Isn't that interesting? A good fight is a fight that you know you're going to be in, but you also know you're going to be victorious at the end. That's a good fight. Now if you lost, that'd be a bad fight. I was in a bad fight. A bad fight means you lost, right? But a good fight, listen, a good fight means that you're victorious. And the Apostle Paul says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and we've got to know that. We've got to be reminded of that. You know one of the things that the devil doesn't want us to know? And that is our spiritual authority in Christ Jesus. You know a little old gray-haired, saintly woman of God that prays and believes God and knows who she is, knows who she is. Within her, she holds more power than all the armies of the world. Why? Because if God is for you, who in the world can be against you? If God is on your side, come on, listen, you are victorious. And, and, and listen, this is part of the Christian life. God wants us to see ourselves that way, as victorious. And I know there's going to be times we struggle, and we're going to go through things. Jesus says, in this world, you're going to have tribulations. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so as he is, listen, as he is, so are we in this world. If he's an overcomer, you're an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Amen? And that's the horse gate. It represents our victory in Christ Jesus over the works of our adversary, the devil. Amen? And then there's the east gate. And that east gate represents the return of Christ and the rapture of the church and our victory as believers as we come back with Christ after that resurrection and after that rapture, we come back with him. The first time he came in on a donkey, you remember that? But this, ne- this last time when he comes back, he's going to be on a horse. And we're going to be riding with him. Some of you need horse riding lessons because you had never even been on a horse, right? For me, it's been a while, right? But we'll get all that down. No worries. The Lord will take care of that. We're going to come riding back with the horse. And this really is going to still happen. And I still believe that, amen? I still believe in the return of Christ, the resurrection of the saints. Now, will it happen in my lifetime? I don't know. But either way, I'm going to be, if I I go by way of the grave, I'm going to be resurrected, right, at the resurrection. And and at the resurrection, the dead in Christ are going to go first. 
And then the, the rest are going to be raptured. And we're going to go there and we're going to spend time with him. And then we're coming back to this earth. And he's going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years during the millennial reign. And then there'll be one more final showdown. And our adversary, the devil, will be completely done away with. And it's just going to get better and better and better, if you can imagine. And that's what that represents right there, that east gate. But finally, today, here's the crescendo. You ready? The east gate. The east gate. Good gracious. You know, with every one of these gates, your, 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 your review gets longer, right? Praise God. So I ain't got but a minute. You ready? Y'all hold on tight. Here we go. What is this? What is this inspection gate? I love what uh, Reverend Timothy Gibson had to say. Reverend Timothy Gibson.com. I'm just going to read what he wrote because I like it. And I can't say it any better. I'm just going to read what he said here. And he reads from the verse. Now listen to this really closely because we're going to tie some things together. And this is where we need the help of the Holy Spirit to help us really see what is this inspection gate all about. He says here in Nehemiah 3, 31 and 32, After him, Mokaja, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the, of the Netham and of the merchants in front of the Mithkad gate and as far as the upper room at the corner. And between the upper room at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. Now that's where it mentions this Mithba gate. Mithba gate. What is the Mithba gate? The final gate is the inspection gate. Also called the prison gate, the Mithka gate, the muster gate, and the gate of gathering. The words appointed place in the Hebrew is the word Mithkad. And Mithkad comes from the verb, the verb Pequod, which means to number. The gate of the city that led to the appointed place was called the Mithkad gate. The Mithkad gate, referred to in Nehemiah 3.31, was located on the east side wall just north of the east gate leading to the temple. The Mithkad gate opened onto the road leading to up to the Mount of Olives just north of the place where the bodies were buried. This road led to the Mithkad or appointed place where people registered for the temple tax. Each person, head account, was taxed at this location. The word Galgatha, used in the Gospels to describe the place of the crucifixion, is an Aramaic word which suggests this area of registry known as Mithkad. The related Hebrew word bears the same meaning. It is Golgalath which means skull, head, or pole, it is a head count. It is a head count. Now right here, when you see that, you think of there's, there's some accounting that takes place. You know, what, you know another word for accounting is reckoning. Reckoning, right? So this final gate, this inspection gate, represents and it leads to that area straight out toward Golgotha, and that whole area and outside the gate, again, was where people mustered, where they were accounted for, uh, the reckoning, where they had to pay for in the form of a tax. There was accounting, there was reckoning that happened. I'm going to read this too, Exodus 38, 25, and 26. And, and this is, there's a reference here. It says, And the silver of them that were numbered, Pequod, Pequod, to a point or number of the congregation of the congregation was a hundred talents and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. A bekoth for every man. This is where God is instituting the temple tax or the the temple tax. A bekoth for every man. Golgath head. That is half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary for everyone that went to be numbered Pequod. So again, this, is, this just gives you some Bible Old Testament reference of, of the first origin of where this began to come together. And, and, and so out of this inspection gate, in that direction, is where the people would muster, they would gather, they would be numbered, counted, an inspection slash reckoning would happen, and they would have to pay their temple tax. Look at this. In the time of Jesus Christ, this place of numbering or registration for the temple tax was called Golgotha. This was the Mithkad 
area of the Mount of Olives east of the temple and near the place outside the city where the bodies of sacrifices were buried. This gate speaks to us of the Bema seat of Christ where our lives are inspected and rewarded appropriately. So this word Bema, this word Bema, Mipka, listen, is connected to the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ that we see in the book of Revelation, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, maybe already you're feeling nervous. I'm going to help you. You ready? Because there are two great judgments that are coming at the end of all, all this. There's the great white throne of judgment. And what is that? That is where everyone, the world, is judged. And for those who did not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and I believe, and I can't tell you exactly how it happens in every case, I believe that every person is given an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. I really believe that. I believe that God is a fair and just God. And that people have, are given the choice and we can choose life or death, blessing and cursing, as it says in Proverbs. And at the great white throne of judgment, there'll be a judgment handed out for really those who would not believe in Jesus and that Jesus was the way. Now, thank God, you and I, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you won't be at that. Because you believed in Jesus Christ. But there will be for us what we call the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. I want to read you a, a scripture here. Let me read you this scripture. You ready? This is 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. It says, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Here's what he says. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we all, but for we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust all are, are, are well known in our conscience. In our conscience. Now I'm going to read that same passage of Scripture in the Amplified in just a moment, because it's going to give clarity to those verses. It's quiet in here. It feels a little tense, right? You know why? Listen, because just when you say the judgment seat of Christ, I got, I got it. I'm not going to be at the great white throne of judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ, like, is that anything for me to be looking forward to? And if you read that verse in the, in the King James, and you read it the way it's written, it could strike some fear in the heart of us even as a believer. Now, you know what the Apostle Peter tells us? To rightly divide the word of truth. He says, study the word of God. Stu you know what study means? What does it mean to study something? It means you take a word and you study it. And the best way to study something is to find the original meaning and representation of a word, a thought, or truth. Amen? And the Apostle Paul tells us to study the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of truth. He says you do that so that you can have confidence, right? Now, when you say the judgment seat of Christ right out of the gate, that doesn't strike a lot of confidence in the heart of most believers. I get it that I'm not going to be at the great white throne of judgment, but this judgment seat of Christ doesn't sound like a party I really want to go to, especially when man adds to it man's hyperbole. Hyperbole. Did I say that right? And you know what that is? It's just man-made thoughts and ideas of what something means. Now, for me growing up, you know, what, you know what kind of picture was painted on this? Now, there's going to be a day you're going to stand before the Lord. And God's going to have these big movie screens in heaven. And he's going to play on that movie screen everything you've ever done, everything you've ever thought. And just right there, I don't even want that to happen. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, can we, can we be real? Just like right there, that's like, that's that dream you had when you're in class in your underwear and you feel so embarrassed. You had that dream. I had it. You had it. And you feel so embarrassed. You feel naked and uncovered. I, I don't know what that comes from, but people have those dreams. I had those dreams, right? And you feel naked and afraid and ashamed and you're like, oh, no, I'm exposed. But can I help you? That line of thinking is not 
The good, and I'll be honest with you, when I say the good news and I throw up thoughts like that, that, that doesn't compute. There's nothing good about that. That doesn't sound good at all. And can I help you? It, listen, can I help you? It's because that's not the truth. Do you know what the word judgment seat means? The word judgment. Now, I'm not making up stuff because you've got to study the Word of God to show yourself. So if I take this word judgment and I look it up in the original word, in the original Greek, you know what word that I find? I find the word bima. I find the word bima. That's the word for judgment in the Greek. And do you know what bima means? I had the definition down here. Here's what it means, and we'll break it down for you. Judgment seat equals bima. Throw that up. Here you go. It means a step, pace, the pace which a foot covers, a foot breadth, a raised place mounted by steps, a platform or tribune. That's what, that's what judgment means. Now, if, like when you read that based on its definition, it really doesn't sound anything like what I thought it was. Can I tell you what a bema is? You ready? Here's a bema. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. In fact, if there were three people here, and, and we had maybe one on that step and one on that step, that might look a little bit like the Olympics. And you ever watch the Olympics awards ceremony? And they're on those raised platforms. You know what that raised platform is in the original Greek? And, you know, and, the, and the Greek, those are the Greek games. They originated in Greece. You know what, that, you know what that's called in the, original, in the original meaning of even the Greek? That's called the bema. And those athletes, and this is why Paul tells us to run our race, so that we might receive a, a crown. Listen, here's what happens. This is the judgment seat of Christ. We stand in that day on the bema, and we're given rewards, not even gold medals, in the form of crowns that are placed upon our head based on what we did in purity for Christ. Now, not what you did and told everybody you did, because the Holy Spirit's going to, that's the testifier. It's going to take all of our works, and, and the testifier's going to come, and it's going to burn away all the dross and all the impurity and all the fleshy stuff that we did because we wanted somebody to see us, right? But then there's those things that we did do, though, that nobody knows about except us and the Lord. That extra thing you did, that, that extra amount you gave, that extra thing that the Lord put in your heart and you followed Him and you did it. And, and listen, there's, there's, there's so much of that that you probably forgot already. You don't even remember, but He remembers every one. And see, if you're not careful, you would read this and think all of my sins are going to be laid out before all everybody at the party and I'm going to be so embarrassed. And that's a lie. You know what this is? You know what the Bema Seat of Christ is? It's rewards day. It's rewards day. Now, if you were like me in school and you were a student like me in school, I like rewards day because it was usually the last day of school or the day before the last day of school. But I didn't like it because I didn't get any rewards. And there were some kids that got every reward. They called their name like every, every three minutes. They got this reward for this, never missing the day of school, highest grade point. I mean, you just name it, right? And I'm just sitting there. To, I'm a spectator the whole time because I was the worst in my class. And it wasn't because I was dumb. It's because I was distracted. <laughs> it was because I wasn't paying attention, right? Thank God my kids aren't like that in Jesus' name. Amen. But I didn't get any. I don't remember ever. I got one reward in school in the first grade above all of my school, and that's because I sold the most candy and I got a bicycle. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I had that bicycle for a long time. I wanted that thing. I went door to door throughout Birmingham, Alabama, where we lived, and sold some candy. And I got that bicycle, right? But this is different. Listen, this one's different. This is the Bema Seat of Christ. And that's what the word means, the Bema Seat of Christ, where we're given rewards for what we've done. And, they're, and listen, and they're given to us in the form of crowns. Wow. Let me read that same verse to you, the same verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. I'm going to read it this time in the Amplified. I'm going to slow down. Now I want you to look at this in its meaning. You ready? Therefore, 
whether we are at home on or earth or away from home and with him, in other words, whether we're dead or alive, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing to him. For we, believers, will be called to account and, and what's the account? What's the account? That's that accounting. There's going to be a reckoning. But it's not going to be a bad thing. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And again, that word judgment seat is bema, seat of Christ, so that each one may be, may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. So what does that look like? Well, that was me on Rewards Day. I got a reward for what I did. It wasn't the reward I wanted. My reward on Rewards Day wasn't they called me up to the platform and told me everything bad I did. I just didn't get some rewards that I wanted. That I, would, I was thinking, and see, I would be determined to, like, next year I'm going to do better. I'm going to get me some of those rewards, and I wouldn't. Right? But listen, listen, listen. The judgment is there's a reckoning. And, the, and you're going to get rewards for what you've done in, in the name of Christ. Listen, and you're not going to get a reward for what you haven't done or what you did wrong. You just won't get a reward for that. And it's that simple. And believe me, you're going to want some rewards. Why are you going to want some rewards? Because these crowns are the crowns that we lay and we cast at the feet of Jesus. And this is when this happens. It's when this happens. He says, he goes on to say, therefore, since we, since we know the fear of the Lord, and that word fear is reverential worship of the Lord, and understand the importance of obedience and worship, we persuade people to be reconciled to Him. In other words, we, we, we persuade the world to be reconciled to Him. But we are plainly known to God. He who knows everything about us, and I hope that we are plainly known also in our consciousness, your God-given discernment. This is what he says. That's, that, that, that's a different light. That's a different light. When you look at that same, those same verses in the Amplified, it shares a whole nother light on the whole concept of the judgment seat of Christ. And you know why? Let me tell you why. Because there was a judgment seat of Christ, like you're thinking. But it happened on that place of Golgotha, just outside the inspection gate. And it was in that place that Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, took away the sin of the world. You know how he took away the sin of the world? He took away the sin of the world by becoming sin for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. Listen, and on that Golgotha, listen, he was on the, he was on the highest step. There, were one, there was one down there, and there was one down there, and he was the tallest one in the middle. And he leaned over before going up on that cross. And you know what they put on his head? A crown. But not a crown that we would want. He took the crown that we deserved but will never have to take. He took upon himself the crown of thorns so that you and I can have a crown of righteousness. Listen, what, what Jesus did on that cross, he went through everything for us so that we would never have to. Wow. So I don't have to worry about the great white throne of judgment. And you know what? It means that this judgment seat of Christ, this Bema seat, this rewards day is a better party than what I thought it was. And it gives me something to look forward to. Can I help you with something? If there's anything about the good news and the gospel that would keep you from looking forward to being with Jesus, it's not of God. It's not of God. Because the good news is good and it's all good. Period. End of story. Do you understand? And I don't think our minds can. Exactly what happened on that cross when he took everything upon himself so that you and I would never have to. So that you and I would never have anything but good to look forward to. Let me give you some verses. I, I'm going to read, a, I'm going to just quote a couple. John 3, 16, I've already said it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And that word everlasting life is zoe life, the abundant life that Jesus talks about in John 10.10. 10. Not just saved and going to heaven, but abundant life even on this earth. This word eternal life means life past, present, and future. And then John 3.17 says, And God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that word saved is the word sozo. And it means to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. And then here's John 18, 318. You ready for this one? There is now, or there is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. Judgment. This judgment, you know, the judgment seat of Christ, it's not that kind of judgment. Because he says right here, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. But anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. Same verse in the NIV says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes in Him who sent me has, or this is John 5, 24, this is Jesus. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word." And believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now that's God's word. It is plain and it's simple. Listen, and that's, that's God's word in its purest form. Can I give you a better picture of what the Bema seat of Christ is going to look like on that day? And he's already shown you the picture once. Can we do it again, Joel? Throw that picture up there for me. Throw that picture of those. That's what it's going to look like. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Listen, where we're given those crowns of righteousness. Paul says, I've run my race. I finished the course, and now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And what you going to do with those crowns? You want as many as you can get. You know why? Because you want to lay them and laud Jesus as you lay them at his feet and worship to him. I've been at a wedding or two in my life where I missed out on the bird seed or the rice at the end. And I just faked it like I was throwing something. I didn't have nothing at all, right? <laughs> Listen, you don't want to be there that day, right? You want something in your hands. That you can lay at the feet of Jesus those crowns of life that you're given on that beam of seat so you can worship Him. And you're going to, oh my goodness, the worship that's going to fill your heart. I can't even, I can't even fathom what that's going to be like. That's, that's amazing. It's amazing. Listen, this inspection gate represents that day. Represents that day. I am so glad that an inspection took place on Golgotha when the Father inspected Jesus. And He saw Him as my sin and your sin. And you know what the Father did? He turned His face away from the Son for the first time in Jesus' life. And He knew it was coming, but yet it hurt Him so bad. He said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And with the weight of the world's sin upon Him, He breathed His last breath. He gave up the ghost. And he was judged for you and for me. He was judged so that you and I would never have to be. And what gives you access to that? Listen, simple belief and trust in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Simple belief. Righteousness by faith and not of works. We believe, we receive, so we are. Wow. It's that simple. Isn't that a blessing? Listen, if it was any harder than that, I can promise you I wouldn't make it. More than likely you wouldn't either. But thank God, Jesus passed the inspection for you and for me. And that you and I, because of him, we've got nothing but good to look forward to. And now that makes sense. David said, surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. And I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It didn't sound like he was worried about no Bemis judgment seat of Christ like we preached it. He's looking forward to it all. He says, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And 
I'm going to get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what it means for you? This is why it says, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? As a believer in Jesus Christ, we have got nothing but good to look forward to. Don't listen to the lies of the adversary that come even in the form of religion. You believe in the goodness of the Lord. You believe in the goodness of the gospel. And you shall be saved. Amen. Let's stand our feet this morning. Let's receive communion together. If you need a cup, a communion cup, would you lift your hand and Doug will, will get you one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You hold in your hand the invitation. And here's the invitation. The invitation is come and eat and come and drink. It's a meal that's been bought and paid for and all you got to do is enjoy it. And Jesus held up that cup and that juice, that wine on the night that he was betrayed. He said, hey, this signifies a new covenant. I'm ratifying the new covenant tonight. And we've had it now for just over 2,000 years. He says, as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. Can you remember without giving thanks? That's why it's called the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. Can you even remember what Jesus did for you on the cross without your heart not being full of thanksgiving? It's impossible. It's impossible. And we remember, listen, we remember, we're thankful, and we apply those truths to our lives afresh and anew. A fresh and a new. Here's the good news. And the good news, Jesus came to save us. And he didn't come just to save us from. He came to save us to. And I love the from part. And if all we had was from, that'd be fine. Saved from hell and to heaven. That would be a plenty. But with it, he gave us even more. And this word saved, everywhere you see it in the New Testament, it is that word sozo, to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. The word made whole literally means nothing missing, nothing broken. So the question to you today, and the invitation is this, is there anything in your life that needs saving today? First of all, have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if you haven't, we're going to pray together in just a moment. And the Apostle Paul says, this salvation is really near you. He says, it's in your heart and in your mouth. In your heart, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised Him from the dead and you confess Him as Lord, he said, you should be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. He says, this salvation is near you. So that salvation is covered. But also with it, listen, everything else that pertains to life and godliness is found in this salvation. So we receive it by faith. So today, again, here's the question. Is there anything in your heart or life that needs saving today? And if that question is yes, receive by faith the salvation of the Lord and watch God work in that situation in your life. He's a miracle working God. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Let's make this confession of faith in our prayer together this morning. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that came to this earth as the spotless lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. We thank you that he died on that cross for our sin and for this abundant life. He went through all those things that he did by his stripes, were healed. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. And Father, today, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we declare that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And Father, we receive salvation today for every part of our being. We thank you that we have a future home in heaven to look forward to. But we also thank you, Lord, that with our permission, our allowance, you will work in our lives to right wrongs and to make crooked paths straight and to bring wholeness where it's needed. And so we ask you to do that today by faith. And Father, just as that woman who'd been sick for 12 years touched your garment and was made whole, Father, we believe today as we take that body and blood of Jesus, which is our point of contact right now, we believe that we are whole, protected from the coronavirus, the flu virus, every 
ailment and ill that the devil would try to bring our way were protected in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Now receive that by faith, if you will. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can you give him praise this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God.